Welcome to everyone who's joined us today for this Q&A with the director and producer of the incredibly, incredibly important film, Overload, America's Toxic Love Story. I'm here with Susie Eastman. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. So you are a documentary filmmaker and short film producer. You have an MFA in producing for film and television. And you are you returned to Louisville to produce and direct By the Wayside, a feature length documentary about the city's homeless. And you are in Kentucky and are gonna tell us all about the film, which we have had um, dozens of people watch overload about toxic chemicals and your story. And I wanted to just get started with, um, you know, how you got involved in this. What made you decide to do this film? Well, um, I was working in Los Angeles. So yes, I did come back to shoot a, a short documentary called By the Wayside um, back in 2005. I came back to Kentucky, shot a little bit here, but went back to Los Angeles where I ended up living for about 15 years and worked in the film industry. And at that point in time, I was very career focused. Probably my, my early 30s is when I started thinking about having kids. And I think that it's very typical that a lot of us, maybe like late night when we're trying to fall asleep, we might pick up our phones or our tablets, computers, and go into like a Google deep dive um, and discover things that like blow us away. Like sometimes we go maybe on a little shopping uh, trip or sometimes we go into a Google information uh, dive. And I found out uh, about EWG's study of 10 Americans, um, which they discovered that no baby is born in the United States with less than 200 synthetic chemicals in their bodies. And that just really blew me away. Um, and it was something that when I would go to work uh, in the industry and talk to people and I'd be like, do you know about this? Um, and they'd say, that sounds like it should be in a film. I'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I just am more concerned about one day when I have kids and talk to somebody else and they'd be like, no, wait, that really seems like something that people should know about. Um, and so what ended up happening is just from talking about it with people when I was kind of blown away by that research, it, it started really impressing upon other people that they wanted to know more information and then they would say to me okay just go get behind a camera and start shooting that film um, and so that's how it how it started wow well you really you know when i watched it is incredible film and i was thinking about how all the college students when i go and give presentations that this should be required watching it was not just incredibly informative. I mean, you hit everything in such a short time, but it was really fun to watch despite the challenging issue that you were covering of toxic chemicals. It really, um, I'm real, thank you so much for making this film. Oh, thank you. Thank you for saying that. I mean, I think that that is something, I love documentaries, um, but I think sometimes when I'm done watching them, I can feel a little hopeless, a little overwhelmed. Um, frustrated, uh, stuck. And so when I was making this film, I was like, I want this to just really be a toolkit. I don't want it just to be gloom and doom. Um, yes, we're in a not so fun situation when it comes to our toxin exposure. Um, however, I do think that there is a little bit of control that we do have, a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel that we can focus on is our consumer power and what we bring into our homes and put on our bodies and feed ourselves and our families. And um, that was my hope all along is to try to create something that people would say, hmm, I wanna go buy some broccoli. I wanna go buy some Pyrex or you know, that one little step is actually a big step. Well, let's talk about the film and you did 30 days of changing what you put on your body and then another 30 days of what went in your body and what came out of your body. Can you talk about that process and you filmed yourself the whole time? Yes. I mean, you know, hindsight, when I was like first starting this, um, I'm not an in front of the camera person. I am definitely, I, I like producing. I like being safely behind the camera, uh, but there was a certain point in which I would have needed to find somebody that I know would have been as dedicated as I was to this, which is like, I wasn't, I didn't have like a, a cheat day. I didn't have when I was on the 30 day cleanse from the Cleveland clinic. Um, I wanted to fully commit to this. And I, I knew that I could do that as long as I could just kind of take that. I don't want to say ego. It's almost like embarrassment or how am I going to be in front of the camera? It's almost like take that thinking 
of being a person in front of the camera and just be like, I'm just a person and I'm going to go through this experience. So for 30 days, the first 30 days, what I tried to do was just be the average American who was going to make a little bit of a change by what I purchased at the store to bring into my home. And that included food and, and that included some habits that were pretty easily attainable and also pretty darn affordable. I think a lot of people think that living a greener life or living a little bit cleaner is very expensive. And in reality, you know, when you go to Target and, I, and something we had spoken about previously was like, sure, some people want to make their own cleaners at home and that's awesome. I'm not that person. And I think there are a lot of people that want to do better, but they think, oh, it's so expensive or it's so hard. And it's like, you can go to the store and look, it's it's actually very similar cost to buy alternatives. So that's what I did for 30 days. And it actually made an impact on what I was carrying in my body. But what I wanted to do for the second 30 days was really test some of these chemicals that are in our body for seven to 10 years. Is there anything that I could actually do to supercharge moving those things out of my body faster? And so, you know, at the end of the film, you can see that some of my levels actually went up a little bit and some people were alarmed about that. But in reality, the up was a great sign because the up means that it was getting ready to go out. And so it was actually doing something by going on that detox. And while that was pretty intense and I don't think that the average person would really enjoy that 30 day detox, even though a lot of my friends have since done it um, after they've watched the film, they've done it as a group of people. Um, it, it's really incredible how just changing some things really can impact what we carry in our bodies. So talk to me about how many chemicals there are that you tested. I, I know that um, it was over $30,000 to do some of the blood tests that you did. And there are over 80,000 chemicals that are or more. But to talk to me about the tests that you did and just a few of the chemicals and what you found. So I tested for 119 of the most commonly used chemicals. Um, and that was through four different labs. Um, and many of the labs were, they rejected my request to use their laboratories. And then three of the four, I had to come in um, under research, uh, the guise of research, not as a filmmaker. They were not interested in participating in allowing me to um, have these chemicals discovered in my body. And the reason for that is because some of these chemicals are made proprietary um, by certain companies. So if I can say on a test, well, look at this chemical and this is in my body at such and such level and it's actually over the CDC's biomonitoring numbers, I can actually kind of pinpoint where it came from, which company made it. And a lot of laboratories don't want to get into like the litigious side of things. Now it was actually, it was $3,500 each time I tested. So the first, second, and third time. So it was a total of about, you know, about $12,000 of blood tests. And that's why I tell people, some people have asked me, like, oh my gosh, how do we get these tests? And I say, you know, here's the thing. I tested as the average American, I'd say like, I'm actually pretty aware, you know, before I went into this, I, I would have thought that I was aware of what I was putting into my body. So let me kind of be the guinea pig for you. You don't really have to go spend $3,500 to see that there are chemicals in your body because I can tell you what, they're there. Um, and so if you look at the phthalates, um, the, the parabens, a lot of these things that are just fragrances and plastics and pesticides that are in our everyday products. These are things that you really don't need to go pay a laboratory, pay a doctor. Um, and it, I, it was a lot of blood also. Uh, you don't have to go do that to actually know that that's what's happening. This was kind of a sociological experiment that I could kind of put myself through to say, you know what? This is what's happening. So why don't you as a consumer join me in making smarter decisions at whatever level is comfortable for you? And you were a makeup artist. I was. I find that I always, I'm like, I don't really know how I, I'm like, uh, okay. Um, but normally, normally it comes up that I'm a makeup artist when I like no makeup on, my hair is like, I'm like, I was a makeup artist and it's not a good look. Um, but yes, I was a makeup artist um, for uh, about um, about nine years for a company, a corporate, and um, not like I, I was at stores 
but I worked corporate for them and you know I love products I I think a lot of people do um, they make us clean and pretty and smell good and all of those things and um, then you add kind of the commercialism to it and gosh I mean I don't, I don't even have to go that route uh, to say that we're kind of all blasted with needing all of these things all the time to look our best and be our best and so I also don't want to go without makeup I mean it, it wasn't like all of a sudden I wanted to be au naturel I wanted to actually still smell good and wear a, a fragrance I wanted to have makeup on I wanted to have nail polish on um, how do I do these things in a less toxic way and so that at first was really really challenging and frustrating and um, I think that that's really the the hump that people have to get over is kind of that first time purchase, that first time going out into the world and saying, okay, I want to replace X, Y, Z. And so what I tell a lot of people is to pick one silo of exposure. So whether it's like bathroom products, whether it's your makeup, whether it's cleaners, um, just pick one of those areas and start there. And also don't throw the things away. Not only do they not have to go into our landfills and into our streams, you've already purchased them, you've already been using them, finish them up, and then as they're empty, go find a better replacement. And that's an easier way to just go look for one shampoo at a time or one you know, hairspray at a time. Well, I can definitely say that for people who are new to this issue, your movie is the perfect entryway into kind of taking the journey, the steps to begin that process, because it really is a journey. It's a process of having a healthier life with what you, the decisions you make, and then hopefully getting involved in policy change so that everyone can afford, um, you know, to, to just go to the store and, and get what they need and have it be safe for them. And um, it is a lot of work to do, I know. I have a couple questions and yes, please put questions in the chat or in the Q&A. Someone asked if you were to distill this down to just four or five key blood tests, what would they be for people who wanna know what is in their bodies? Mm -hmm. So I will say to you that, so I have to, I have to kind of walk a very, a, a line like I can't I, I can't say the lab names that that I'm mm. not that I didn't have permission to use um, but there is um, Genova diagnostic they make something called a toxic core panel and that is six hundred dollars and I believe it's around 40 35 40 chemicals and I would say that that is probably your most affordable bet because the other ones not um, really patient access, right? Like, and um, I do believe you have to use a doctor who has um, a relationship with Genova Diagnostics, um, but they would be whom I would suggest for their toxic core panel. And that's your bisphenol A, that's, uh, I believe, a lot of your phthalates, that's mm -hmm. parabens, um, that's uh, triclosan, that is. Uh, some of the um, like some of the benzene the styrene i believe that's in there as, as well so you'll be able to get a little bit of information about your plasticizers about your fragrance about your um about your volatile organ organic compounds um, and then a couple of your pesticides but again you can go spend that six hundred dollars and look at that gauge here's the other thing a lot of those toxins that i just you know just listed those are in and out of our body in hours or days at best. So if you have a couple days where you've just eaten a whole bunch of organic food and you go pay $600 to have this, um, you're likely to have a different read than if you've been in a different situation. So I think the thing is really not necessarily going to spend that $600 on this test. Go spend that $600 on some alternatives to bring into your home um, or make gift baskets. That's what I did. Whenever somebody gets into a new home, I make housewarming presents that are literally like eight brand new products from the either like 365 every day or, you know, um, one of the cleaner brands, seventh generation over at Target. I introduce other people to these alternatives that might be kind of on the fence or unaware mm -hmm. about it. And that I think is an even better way to spend that $600 versus having a blood test. But that is just my opinion. So go over to Genova and get the toxic core or go online and get some alternatives. So there are some interesting um, facts in here that I was not aware of. Um, the CDC looks at blood 
every year and does biomonitoring. Can you talk about that and where can we find that information? So um, the CDC is, it's actually like, oh, well, I'm like, it's a really exciting report, which you all are probably like, it's like thousands of pages of toxicology. Oh, yeah. But I'm like, oh, um, that used to be, that used to be what filled my, my days and nights. And now I'm like reading like toddler books, like one, two, three, look at me. Very different than like the level of phthalates just 10 years ago was such and such compared to now. So if you go um, just to Google and look up the CDC National Biomonitoring Program, um, I believe it's roughly every three to five years for a chemical class. And it's I see. Tens of thousands of people participate in these biomonitoring um, studies that they do. And it's really fascinating because not only are we able to see look at this from lead exposure or certain uh, certain things that have been taken out of products uh, you know just 10 15 years ago we can actually begin to see where it's tracking to go down and that's just really huge that can that can really be the carrot for all of us to say look if we do make change at a, a national level we all can benefit from it um, but that CDC biomonitoring um, the, the, the reports are what we use to kind of take my results and compare to them to see where I stood against that national average. I see. I thought one of the most incredible um, other facts that you had in there and for if you haven't seen the film I would urge everyone to take the time to watch this incredible film like that in hair straighteners there is formaldehyde more than you would get when you embalm a body mm -hmm. like I I don't I don't need that on my head. I don't need that going into my body. I mean, something I mentioned to you earlier is like, I guess, you know, people could have a debate about whether or not we really need to be preserving people that are going under the ground anyway. But let's just talk about those of us that are living, having that sort of preservative, uh, you know, that sort of chemical compound in the air around us, on our hair. But the thing we don't really realize is like formaldehyde is also hugely located in like new carpets. Uh, it's located in, uh, for instance, I, I was a renter for a while when I had my baby and they wanted to replace the flooring and they were gonna put in more laminate flooring. And laminate flooring is just, it's gonna off gas for around seven years uh, of VOCs including formaldehyde. And it's like these things, Maybe we do need them to embalm bodies to put underground for in perpetuity, but do we really need them as hair straighteners? I implore these com these companies to find alternatives that can help us reach reach our beauty goals realistically, um, but not also with a detriment to our health. I know there's a lot a lot of work that needs to be done, and I'll point out Women's Voices for the Earth, Environmental Health Trust. Um, and many other organizations that we will have near this when it is online. So you can click and learn more about organizations that are working on this, both in educating the public as your movie does in an incredible way, and as well in getting policy change. So that companies have to say what is in their products and inform people because we're not even informed as to like, like as you put it with fragrance and with cleaning products, they don't even have to list what's in there. No. And, and the thing is that oftentimes like I'll call a, um, I'll call the company to find out what well, I'm really fun like that. Um, for instance, I, I really wanted a kiddie pool for my babe and I don't do PVC. I'm not doing vinyl here. I'm not bringing soft sided pools around here. There are no floaties. There are no, I, and yes, you could say, okay, I'm denying her some childhood stuff, but she goes over to other people's houses. She goes places and gets exposure, I'm sure, from time to time. But, um, you know, I wanted to find a one of those little pools, and it turns out, you know those hard-sided pools, those mm -hmm. hard plastic pools? Those are made of polyethylene, mm -hmm. completely recyclable. They're not leaching. They're very healthy. And I went to Big Lots and I spent $7 and I got that pool. And I can remember when I got there that there was a phone number because I couldn't see what the pool was made out of. So I called the 800 number and I ended up calling Mexico 
I speak very broken Spanish and I'm asking if it contains polyethylene. I'm like, wait, now I know the name of these chemicals and in Spanish. Um, but it's about doing that extra level of research. But it really, the thing that actually gets me a little angry is that I shouldn't have to be calling Mexico from a big lots to ask what a pool is made out of so I can make a decision of whether it's safe or not for my child to be around. You shouldn't be doing that. I shouldn't be doing that. But that's the situation we're in. So yeah, it's great that we can ask these questions, that we can become chemists and figure it out. But I just don't think that that's... I don't think it's fair. Uh, I pay taxes to feel like there is some sort of um, protection for citizens, for children, for our health, for our environment. And so it just kind of feels like it's open season for these corporations to be able to do whatever they want and not uh, have us protected as the consumers who think that there is some level of that for us. Yes, it's been open season for a long time. Dr. Deborah Davis, who is one of the founders of Environmental Health Trust, wrote The Secret War, The History on Cancer, which is an incredible uh, look over decades of how that information has been known, but not put forward. Um, so I had a, a few questions here. Um, one statement in question, I was blown away by the statement from one of your scientists who said, 80% of our cancers are related to the environment in one form or the other. How did you feel when you heard this? Well, um, I mean, I, I think that it's, it's sad. I mean, I, I think that it, it's sad, but I, I think that that just actually, it activates me to want to, to do more for myself, to be a, an advocate for myself, for my family, for you, for people that can't, you know, something we talked about was the um, environmental justice a justice aspect, is that if you look at the environment causing these cancers, causing these the irreparable harm to communities, they are largely communities of color, uh, and it is a disproportionate amount where these factories are being put in and where the air is absolutely toxic as can be. And so I think that there is a side of me that responds to that with anger and another side of it that responds kind of as like a mama bear that's like, yeah, and that's exactly why I do what I do and I buy what I buy and I feel what I feel. Um, I don't necessarily preach to other people. I mean, I, I, I do what I do. And if people ask me about it, then I'm always there to offer input or advice make suggestions, but um, more than anything, it activates me into continuing to make the best decisions for myself and my family. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, when, when we think about all these toxic chemicals that we're putting on our body or that, you know, we, we have, it's like, well, it was made somewhere and imagine the impact to the workers and to the people who live near there. And you showed the community where it was a super fun site and uh, people are living right up against those air, that land that's so toxic that it's a super fun site. And we know that it goes up into the air, right? And into the, into the soil, into the food. It's, it's not staying in the ground, into the water. True, true. And uh, there are a lot of people just even in my neighborhood that spray for mosquitoes. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, I think is like, you think, first of all, it doesn't just kill mosquitoes. It, it, you, there are a lot of other little things that we need, the biodiversity that also are being sprayed. But the thing that's also sad to me is that as soon as it rains, all of that pesticide is now being put into the streams. I watch birds that are taking a bath in a puddle, and I think to myself, like, that puddle is absolutely full of toxins. And so I think a lot of times we just think, oh, this is convenience. I'm just going to put this on my body. I'm just going to spray this because it smells good. I'm just going to spray this weed because it kills this one weed. We don't really think about the trickle down effect or like what you're saying is this came from somewhere. People's livelihoods are being made creating this product. Um, this has to be disposed of somewhere. Um, and I think that a lot of times we don't really think about the whole supply chain and yes. the life, life cycle of these things. 
we need to start thinking about the entire life cycle from cradle to grave. And, you know, when you had that image of the, uh, the man, you're in your apartment or, or, or your home and someone was spraying outside and I was struck, although you didn't talk about it, but that his pants were wet with what he was spraying from the legs down. And we know now with glyphosate and Monsanto and the cases, all of these workers who are doing this job are getting covered in addition to the communities that are being covered. Absolutely. That, Absolutely. that was so powerful. I mean, his, he, they were soaked. Yeah. And it's like his shoes were like shiny from it. I mean, I think that honestly, like in that moment, I was so shaken. And then also it goes to that back what I was saying about not being not remembering always that I was in front of the camera. Like, yes, I, I'm a filmmaker. I wanted to capture the story, but I also wanted to be in it. And I think that there would like be in the moment. And there was a part of me that was just so shocked that this was happening. You know, that I was, I had been feeling not so great on that detox. I was so committed to it. And then there was nothing I could do to escape it. And I think that speaks to the fact that we have control over so much and then we don't on others. So that's why it's like, do what we can uh, when it comes to our own homes. And then we have to do more uh, when it comes to these larger community exposures. Yeah, I know for me as a mother, sort of making that connection, you know, there's so much you can do in your own family. And then you, it becomes quite clear, quite fast, that we need to have that personal as the political, that, uh, that you can't fix it all in your home. It's, it's a step, it's a journey, but then next step is getting involved in, in the political process and in the laws that affect every part of our lives. Absolutely. And making it known, like, like I said, I don't, I don't try to be very preachy, but people, I try to just include them in things. When, when they come to my house, they realize there are alternatives around here. They see that there are different things that they can be using or doing. And so that's a, a powerful way to spread it as well. Not, not to be pushy on everybody. I mean, I guess it also does help that I have a film that I can just be like, and go watch this if you want to see why I do this. And then, you know, even some of my my guy friends that are super, I don't know, just wasteful. And I don't even know, they probably use like Axe body spray. But when they watched my film, they started sending me pictures of them at the store buying glass containers and, you know, buying some different products. Or, and even some guys have been like, is this skincare safe? I've never cared about skincare before. And I'm like, oh, I'm so proud. So it's uh, it's been really cool to watch that change happen. And so I think that can happen for all of us. We just share a little bit with the people around us, not preach, just share, invite people to the table of, of making change for all of us. Yeah. Invite people to the table. That's a nice, nice way of talking about that. Um, and then we have to keep our, our agencies accountable. So uh, someone asked in the chat, what do you have? It sounds like you have an advocate in Senator Tom Udall. Um, what, what what is happening now in terms of regulation and what what do you think people can do to make those changes that really we need to have so that we can be safe well if if i can be honest with you one of the things that i i think is really really important and this is i have become more interested in california policy than i ever have before mm -hmm. because i have learned that california policy is really what dictates what happens to the rest of the country when it comes to some big environmental moves. So while I think it's great when we have things introduced to the Senate and Congress, because we have such a split there, it's actually really hard to get movement. Things like that Lautenberg Act, you know, it happened. Right. Eh, nothing's really happened. Nothing's really changed. A lot of things have gotten greenwashed, but I'll tell you what, a lot of the things are happening because consumers are interested in it because right. brands want that kind of that social media uh, attention. They want attention from consumers that are putting things out there and getting word of mouth out. So I say that I still think that it has a lot to do with consumer power, but I also focus a lot on California and what they're doing in terms of legislation because when California makes a, a new law, it impacts all of us. This is so true. And thank you to all of you in California who are helping push and around the nation, helping make that happen for labeling. And um, so goes California. 
and then Massachusetts and, or, you know, and yes. so. And then eventually the 50th state to tack on is Kentucky, where I live now. <laughs> Kentucky's like, well, I guess we'll join. We don't have any choice because those Californians were here. <laughs> and so, so please keep doing it so that Kentucky can finally just ride the wave with all of this. <laughs> Yes. Well, so let me give you some of some of the comments um, that we're getting. Thank you for your documentary. What is very telling is that toxic exposures from consumer products, pesticides, fragrances, and other toxicants um, were a prevalent cause, was a prevalent cause back in the early 2000s to inform the public. Yet the public is still so uninformed on such a broad scale, and the lobbyists still control the science, well, the lobbyists and the, the companies with the, the um, scientific studies that they put together showing how harmful these chemicals are, it's being suppressed, and especially the synergistic combinations. Let's talk about body burden for a minute. And, and if you could talk about what that means and what you learned about that. Absolutely. So, you know, body burden is basically uh, the the word used to describe what level of toxins we have in our bodies and what we carry around with us. And so I had my body burden measured through biomonitoring. So biomonitoring measures the burden of toxins on the body. And so the thing that I do think is very interesting, what you mentioned, or one of the individuals um, watching mentioned is the synchronicity like when you have the combination of these toxins that's what we don't know right that's where it becomes kind of that the area where it gets a little frightening to me it's like okay so you can go and these companies can say oh such and such chemical is safe even though we can look at other studies that say mm, this is actually potentially an issue over here or we can make causal inferences of some, some major issues and um, also they test they test one at a time exactly and when they test when they test animals they're testing one chemical at a time exactly so that's where it's we are all guinea pigs right now because you first of all we can't do human studies which is like kind of a shame. I really wish we could be like, prisoner X, would you like to get out a little bit early and come over here and do this? I'm like, I'm teasing kind of. We've, um, we've done that. <laughs> well, by choice though. I mean, I'm like not, yeah, I'm like, oh, I don't want to get back. I don't want to do anything. I'm not on by choice, but yeah. Yeah, I'm like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, take away people's liberties. I'm, but I'm just trying to think of a way where I wish that we actually could find out a little bit more about the harm of these chemicals when they're being used together. And all of us, as that study of 10 Americans showed, as my test results showed, as the CDC biomonitoring studies show, we are full of multiple chemicals. So what does it mean when there's a pesticide dancing with a plastic? What does it mean when I have a flame retardant hanging out with a fragrance? We don't know. Um, we just know that we are not doing well. And we know that doctors are saying 80% of our illnesses are tied to environmental causes. So if that's the case, that's just a very scary situation to be in and something that we really can't get to the root of. Well, we can get to the root of it by doing the, the actions that these environmental groups are working on, because I don't think we even need to know any more, right? We, we know enough to know we have to reduce exposure to these, these chemicals, which you've shown how you can decrease so many of them by changing what's on your body, what you put in your body, how you help your body clear these, uh, these toxins. Um, and it's unacceptable. I think it's it's so important because it's invisible. Yes. Yeah. So then those numbers, it really is being absorbed into our bodies, into our children's bodies, into communities. And I think you mentioned something um, about you just mentioned about like getting it out of our bodies. And that's the thing is what we need to understand is that even if we're buying different products, we're still going to have some exposures. So that's why it's like I love, I still eat broccoli. I still try to sauna or, you know, get, take some super hot showers or take a jog because in reality, I still need my body's defenses uh, and own detoxification system 
to be working because of all the exposures that I have to so many things. You know, even when we talk about like small, all of the things that we we are exposed to as human animals each day is when we eat the fuel that keeps us detoxing well, when we have positive uh, you know, mindset, so the body is not taxed with stress and cortisol, those sorts of things. We just take a beat, take a, a deep breath, and just try to do the best that we can. I think that that also helps a lot of those exposures as well. Right. Well, so um, I'm my dog right here because my dog started talking. She's a talking dog. I'm like, this is not the time. Oh, <laughs> I can't. I can't hear your dog yet, but I'd be glad to 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 hear your your dog. Um, so, um, someone wrote in the chat a whole other bucket issue, which I know you probably didn't have time to tackle, building material. Um, formaldehyde is also present in the insulation in the walls of our houses. It can out, outgas uh, for up to 30 years. Insulation is available that does not contain formaldehyde, but it's expensive. And of course, it's carcinogenic. And I, who had to fix my house, have gone through that road of being on the phone with every company. Just, does it have formaldehyde? And then I was like, well, I don't know if I want it with that. Um, gosh, I can't believe I forgot because I knew every kind of insulation in the whole world when I was figuring this out. The rock, now they have the rock, oh. which could be asbestos-like, and that doesn't have formaldehyde, but it also has fibers, which could be acting like asbestos. Of course, insulation also uh, gets in your lungs. Then there's the, let's talk about building materials more. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just bought my first house and that started coming up. Now, carpet is something. Carpet. I can remember, so when I first walked into the house, I can remember her saying, now we just replaced the floors. And, I, and she's like, these are um, non-toxic bamboo that we paid, like, uh, you know, we found a really great bamboo option. And I was like, this is my home. I was like, look, from my first step on the floor is like not laminate or not brand new carpet. You know, a lot of places will be like, oh, and the carpet's been replaced and we just painted the walls. And I'm like, no, that's actually not what I want. Um, I want to be able to go get my like my no VOC paint or put in my bamboo floors. Um, so this is a very common situation that a lot of people have finding these things and so I think it's like it's kind of the hierarchy right so I try to find whatever's the healthiest like a lot of my carpets um, when I get a rug I go to Ikea because those are made without a lot of chemicals and so you're finding healthier standards um, that are not breaking the bank so I, I just try to find outlets for some of those things but like you said some building materials we simply can't escape and so I, I personally do not have an air uh, purification system, um, but I know a lot of people do utilize that. Mm -hmm. And so they have some, like a, either a whole house or a, a couple different ones around. And so if that's something that's um, of concern to you, you know, in my case, I don't have new materials that are in this building from at least been at least five or six years since they've done anything that's been new bringing it in other than the paints and the paints are low VOC that they used. So that felt good to me. But I think it's just about doing the research and then deciding, okay, do I have to go with this route? And if I do, then why don't I go ahead and get the purification system that'll go ahead and take care of some of these things in the air? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the, the um, I'm glad to, paint is an example of changes that have happened over time because of course, there was lead in paint, which we took out in the United States decades after we knew that it was toxic, but they have been reducing the VOC. It's not, you know, completely at the level that it, it should be, but that has been consumer pressure and certainly the work of all the groups that are that are working on that. Indoor air quality is something a lot of people aren't that aware of, you know, that the new thing they bought is, is off-gassing and... Um, yeah, or you even look at the fact that like my whole childhood, all I wanted was a gas grill. I love cooking on gas. And then I moved to California mm -hmm. and every, most apartments are gas uh, ranges, sorry, not gas grill, gas ranges out there. And oh, oh my gosh, this is all I wanted was a gas stove. So I'm so excited. I find this house and it has a gas stove and I'm like, this is awesome. And then I'm like, wait, I haven't really looked at how that impacts air quality. And it's like, are you ready to be burning carbon monoxide and uh, formaldehyde in your home? And I'm like, the thing I wished for this whole time yeah. is not going to kill us. So, I mean, obviously it doesn't, it doesn't come with a hood. So I open up all the windows, you know, I do the best that I can. 
and then eventually I'll cap the gas and then put an electrical oven in here, even though all I wanted was gas. Yeah, we just moved. We're in a similar boat there and, you know, haven't made the switch just because of the, the cost of, of, of doing all that. It's, exactly. um, you know, what I love about your, your movie is it's fun. Oh, uh, thank you. And it, it, it was, it was fun to watch, even though it was such a, uh, you know, a serious issue because people are dying and from to, uh, toxic exposures and sick. And if you look at all the, uh, the cancers that have increased and what you talk about in your movie, what Dr. Davis talks about, what we've been working on for years, this is, you know, what, what's the next step for people? What has okay. helped, what has helped people who you're working with move to the next step of policy change? Honestly, I think that, well, I think that COVID was a little tough in the very beginning, to be honest with you. I think that so many people became very scared about protecting their families that it, it no longer mattered what they were bringing into their homes in terms of what kind of sprays they could get their hands on, bleach they could buy, you know, all of the different antibacterial things uh, that we've been using. So I think that we are going, we, we've now started correcting back over from what, and what I'm talking about people is, I would say that I'm around mostly moderate um, environment, like moderate people when it comes to the environment. Um, when I lived in California, very much kind of surrounded by my type of people, our type of people that are very cognizant of what's going on in the world and exposures. And here living in Louisville, Kentucky, it's a different scenario. Um, a lot of times people have their blinders on, they just want what's cheap, easy. Uh, that's just really what a lot of the focus is. Um, but I think that that was actually amped up even more when COVID happened, that people were like, just whatever I can get my hands on, whatever won't get me sick, whatever keeps my family safe. And so it's been really nice these past few months to see people starting to kind of go back into prioritizing um, some of their purchasing thinking a little bit more deeply about their health and their family's health, not just as it relates to a pandemic, but kind of large scale. I think a lot of us saw um, kind of our, our own fragility of life. Uh, we had it kind of, so maybe this can be a moment for all of us to be able to say, wow, life is truly fleeting. And we really do have one shot here. What can we do to be making, um, an impact on our lives and future generations. So I feel like a lot of people that I'm around are kind of in this contemplative time of wondering what they can do. And so that's really, to me, motivates me, should motivate all of us to make sure that we put information out there, that we put guides out there, that we welcome people to, to join us, to, to watch these films. Um, and, and continue these sorts of conversations and not in a proselytizing kind of way, um, in a let's talk about this. Let's talk about how we can all do this together. Yeah. Well, so I'm going to pull out a couple more things that people are, are raising and talking about. And thank you, Debbie. Um, she points out was, I was taking notes when I watched your film. I was like, well, all right, you know, and um, I, I had this one as really fascinating that the World War II blood tests that were done, they had zero body burden. They had close to none of some of these chemicals that you found at such high amounts in your body. And, and the thing is like, that kind of actually makes me sad. It's like, we're, I, yes, we, you know, World War II is, it's been a while, um, but at the same time, it's not been that long. And so when we look at what we have done, how we have dumped on our planet, how we've dumped into our bodies for the sake of commercialism, consumerism, um, you know, convenience, all of these things um, without being cognizant of what, how we're building and creating things. Um, and, and, and looking at, we talk the cradle to grave with the fact that we are just looking at like, oh, here's the need. Let's crank something out. It doesn't matter about the toxicity. It doesn't matter about the risk. Like, let's just fix this one thing. Well, guess what? We're actually creating like all the little cracks around it that are going to eventually cause the whole bottom to break out. So it's like, I think that, yeah, it's just, it, it, it's pretty staggering that so recently we were so clean, but here we are. And um, 
now it's time for all of us to be engaged to do something. Yes. It, so a couple more comments and questions. Um, triclosan says, uh, Jerry, was used in antibacterial soap. And when it comes in contact with chlorinated water, it produces chloroform gas, a carcinogen, but the public was never told this. I know I used to always make sure to buy, I think it was in toothpaste too. And it made it, you know, the cleanest toothpaste would have triclosan, which triclosan is like everything. Can you talk about triclosan a little bit and what it's in and what people need to know about it? Well, I mean, so I'll be honest with you, like I'm, I'm not, I'm not a chemist, so I can't speak to where, where it is now, or I, I know that it has been listed as a, one of the chemicals of concern. So I know that it is not actually as prevalent uh, as it once was, and that people see it as one of those buzzwords like BPA, even though in the case of BPA, and probably in triclosan as well, uh, in the case of BPA, there's BPS. Like there, right. there's really, there are always replacements that just have a different name. So you can go ahead and you can put BPA free on things. You can put triclosan free on things and guess what? There's probably something in there just as toxic, which is kind of that gross, we call it, you know, the whack-a-mole. You're like, okay, BPA is gone. Right. Wait, there's BPS. Oh gosh, there's triclosan. Um, you know, it's like, we're always kind of chasing after everything instead of it really being a preventive policy where we, uh, the precautionary principle takes place, where we're, we're protected before something comes out. So I can't speak to what type of products are coming out. I know that when I'm looking at hand washes now and looking at antibacterial things, I'm seeing different uh, chemical compounds. I'm not seeing triclosan anymore. Um, but just because that's the case, what are these like other names that I can't pronounce that are on the back of these products? The replacement products, the replacement, it just, yes, I, I remember when I was pregnant and I just was learning about this issue and we would get water and I started buying water in containers, which was plastic. And I ended up on the phone and I started to be like, you know, maybe it's not good that it's sitting outside in the plastic bottle, you know, the five big water things outside. And I got on the phone and I ended up with the direct or the, the owner of the company of the water place I will not mention. And he was so condescending to me. He was like, I was like this BPA I'm reading about, you know, I was on EWG's website because I was going down the deck road with the um, arsenic in our deck, which was among the highest arsenic of in Montgomery County. Anyway, so I'm on the phone and he said, I wouldn't worry about it. It's just a little bit of what, of, you know, BPA and you don't have to worry about it, honey. And of course, now we know that dose does not make the poison. <laughs> that is... Yeah, that's that I, 20 years ago. I don't know how I would have done how I would have done with that call. Um, but yeah, that's I mean, and I think that's a lot of people, a lot of the mindset is like, oh, it's such a small amount. So small. But again, it's in symphony with a lot of other things that are in our bodies. And maybe if it was just one tiny little speck of BPA and that was the only thing we were exposed to all day in our like Garden of Eden, it would be very different. But it's not that case. So that man May his family be pro like healthy and prosperous. May nobody have grown breast buds at age four. May nobody have, you know, hormone-related issues or neurological disorders. But he was absolutely off base. Uh, and that's really a shame. Yeah, well, it's just a story repeated over and over again. Um, and I'm glad that you told the story of Tyrone and Atrazine. And, you know, you had um, just... So thank you for doing that because I um, certainly know a lot about his work, but I wanted to read a few more things before our time ends. It was a wonderfully done movie and both entertaining and informative. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. I have toxic encep encephalopathy, commonly called multiple chemical sensitivity. So I'm super aware of what chemicals are in people and I'm glad people can watch your movie and learn. My heart goes out to that person. That's... That I have, I've encountered that as I've been not personally, like I have not experienced it myself, but I have been around people while making this film that suffer from that. And my heart breaks for them because it is, it's like a very warped peanut allergy, you know, because there's no escaping it. You think about these people who just simply by breathing, 
you know, being in the air around peanuts. And it's like, it's very similar. Like when you have this multiple chemical sensitivity, it is absolutely debilitating. So my heart just goes out to those individuals. And I'm just sorry that we're in a situation where that, that occurs. I know that we've got to fix this. Um, I mean, I walk down my street, people with dryer, they, the dryer sheets, you can't even walk down the street without, you know, much right. less people coming into your home or going anywhere, accessing any place. So a lot of work needs to be done. Um, I have where, um, Nancy says, where were they able to test for these chemicals in World War II? Was it as dioxin from blood samples? And what chemicals did they test for? Did they know that they were toxic? Yeah, how did you find that information about World War II? So, I mean, that's not information. That's not research that I did. That's a, that is from the Story of Stuff project. That is ah. their, that was their, their representative who used that information. So I didn't go and do the research. That's part of their research. Um, but I would assume, I'm going to be making assumptions here, which is not generally how I like to do anything, especially in a, in a Q&A. But if I were to make an assumption, it would be that there were, there were blood samples that were taken and probably preserved that have been since tested. I wouldn't think that at that time they had kind of the sensitivity or the notion to be able to test for some of these chemicals. They probably have gone back to test them um, because I would think that they would probably have just been kind of aware of dioxins, but not even really thinking about um, the danger of our exposures to those. So I think that this would probably be a case of going back to samples and, and testing them at a later date. Mm -hmm. well, this is, I wanna, I'm very interested in this myself. I was just looking at some of the old footage, the military footage actually, where uh, the United States government went and sprayed uh, DDT on the Italians and many communities as a project to rid them of uh, disease. Um, so I'm, I'm very curious about that. I guess to, to wind up, you end your movie um, with having a baby. And now that you are a mother, because you did that movie before you were, can you talk about what, like what's changed and where are you with all of this now that you have a child? Um, I... Well, I will definitely say that I owe my daughter's life to this film. I mean, I, I, I didn't go too deeply into the fertility side of things, but I, as my mother so kindly said, I was barren um, back when I started this film. I'm like, that is a little bit of an antiquated verbiage. Thank you. I'm like, thank you, dramatic. Like, let's just have some hope as we go into this. Let's see what happens. Um, so, I mean, like, I did not have eggs when I went into this. And so to simply clean up my life and then get pregnant my first time trying with no meds and no doctors at age 38 and a half um, is pretty staggering. Um, I was given a 2% chance of getting pregnant each time I tried and I did it my first time trying. And I felt such appreciation in that and I thought to myself, thank you, Overload. And then I gave birth to a premature baby weighing four pounds, four ounces, who didn't need to go on a ventilator, who didn't need a feeding tube, who didn't need anything. She was in NICU and the doctors asked me, what did you eat while you were pregnant? What did you do while you were pregnant? Multiple doctors asked me. They said that they had not seen someone so tiny but mighty. And that's what they would call her, tiny but mighty. And they were like, whatever you did while you were pregnant is a testament because she is so strong. And now my two-year-old is wearing 4T. She is the height of a four-year-old. She eats probably 90% organic. So what I did in Overload, the first 30 days, I would say is what I do 80 or 90% of the time. Um, I, don't, I don't really stray from that. And the reason I don't is because the proof was shown to me in the fact that you know, I, I look at things like whether people are choose or not to have children is entirely their, their choice. For me, I, I knew that I wanted to have a child. And so when the fact that as an animal, and I felt very just animalistic about having a child, that my animalistic ability to procreate was made 
kind of, I don't want to say that easy, but I kind of cleaned up so much and then it just happened that way. It kind of felt like a way of showing the doors were opening to say, this is how you should live. Like live conscientiously, live in awareness of what you're being exposed to. And, and with that will come greater health. So at 42, I will tell you that I feel better than I ever did in my 20s. I feel better than I did in my early 30s. Um, I have had fertility tests still, and it looks as though I have the fertility of early 30s. Um, at 42, which is not common, um, I am actually getting ready to freeze my eggs in two weeks because I can. And I don't think that that's very common. I mean, yeah, some people at 42 do it, but it's like I feel like I wanted to make this film and I want to continue on in this life and have these conversations with people and just be honest about where I am and what I do and what choices I'm making because I think that it has absolutely impacted my life. It's allowed me to have my child and, and kind of clean up my act and become fertile and feel healthy and regain health that I never had had before. So I just wanna share that with other people in hopes that hopefully this can help them. And I know it's not a panacea. I know that it's not gonna help everybody. Um, it, we have all different reasons for infertility. But in my case, this worked, and um, I just want other people to be able to see it for whatever kind of reasons they might have issues in their life, different health issues. There are sometimes happy endings to it. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for making this film. And I know that um, you know your daughter will, will is is actually her world has changed because of it. Oh yeah, this, I mean this is this is her world. Sometimes she'll you know, she'll point at something that says overload on it and be like, mama's film, our film. And I'm like, it is our film, baby. It's the way, it's the reason I have you. So um, I was just going to say um, in closing that if anybody has uh, any kind of further questions or any conversations, so I'm on, um, I'm on Instagram at Susie Eastman and at overload film, but also I have a website called cleanergreenerme.com and that's where a lot of the different products that I use, a lot of the different organizations that I love. Um, it's just a really a toolkit to continue the conversation with everybody. So if people want to check that out, unfortunately my film got taken down off of Amazon, which is suspicious uh, at best, um, but it is still for rent on Vimeo. So if you have anybody that you'd like to share it with, um, I just encourage you to please uh, share that with individuals. You can get the link for that at overloadfilm.com and that way we can try to continue having people watch the film and hopefully, like you said, it's lighthearted, it's engaging. I'm using your words, not not my own. I'm an artist. I'm supposed to be like, I should have done this better. Um, but, you know, I would love to be able to continue the conversation with all of you all or have you share it with other people so that they can make changes so all of us can have a, a cleaner and greener future. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks to everyone for joining us.